Thank you very much, Jennifer, and thank you very much for inviting me. I, I uh, spoke with Matt and um, I think Karen when I was at the BioCurators meeting presenting on hypothesis. And just to give a little background, um, I am the, currently the director of biosciences at Hypothesis. Um, I joined them after retiring from my position at UCSD as a professor of neuroscience. So I always kind of put that background in because um, I still maintain my lab in the university and I both use Hypothesis as a researcher and also seek to, um, you know, help the, its development. Um, and I'm also founder of a uh, company called SciCrunch.com, which deals with things called research resource identifiers. And I put that on because the conflict of interest rules require me to do so. So that's why I always put it there and explain. But basically, I wear uh, many hats. And the thing that attracted me to hypothesis as a neuroscientist and also as someone who's been working across trying to modernize uh, scholarly communications and scientific communications is the potential power of being able to have this open uh, interactive layer that we build on top of stable um, scholarly artifacts like scientific articles. So you should feel free. I can't see the, the, the uh, list, but feel free during any time to interrupt me. Uh, I'm going to go back and forth between slides and uh, also a live demo. And I invite everybody to um, open up a Hypothesis account and install the browser and uh, the extension and follow along. So Hypothesis um, is interesting. It's a technology company, but it was founded as a nonprofit. And it was founded as a nonprofit because uh, the Dan Whaley, who is the CEO, and those in Hypothesis believed that this is a, an opportunity to deploy something that is open and non-proprietary, so something that basically is, um, oops, sorry, I think that's some kind of alert, um, something that uh, would uh, decrease the fragmentation that we currently have rather than increase the fragmentation. So Hypothesis is currently free to use and install. Uh, as I'll talk about, um, uh, Hypothesis does host currently your annotations, but your annotations belong to you. They're covered under um, open licenses. And so this is really meant to be an enabling technology that can be deployed and developed um, as something that will serve science and scholarship in general. So basically what Hypothesis is, is a uh, web-based annotation tool, as it said in my introductory slide. What does that mean? It means that Hypothesis um, can be used through um, most browsers, not all browsers, but most browsers, to create um, inline annotations. And this is an example from uh, PubMed. And you see these highlights uh, here, and then over in the right, an annotation um, overlay. This is uh, apparent. This is not embedded into PubMed. This is a function of an extension that you put in in your browser. But because you're annotating um, on the web, uh, Hypothesis has a, all of the features that you would expect of web-based tools. You can share annotations. You can search annotations across all of the different places that you uh, put them. Um, you can reply to them. Um, so basically, it is dynamic and designed to be used in a web context. So the way that I think about Hypothesis in its most simple form is it's a way of being able to take notes on the web, not just bookmarking entire pages, which is uh, the current standard, or commenting down below in a uh, chat window, but actually being able to select granular parts of a uh, web document, including scientific articles, and attach an annotation to them. So annotation is generally considered to be distinct from commenting by this very specific anchoring to specific fragments and by really being a type of marginalia, right? We've annotated for years. And so uh, over in the sidebar, we put these comments. And I'll do a live demo and show how this works. But uh, the interesting thing about Hypothesis is uh, it really has pushed as an organization for an open annotation standard. We know that in biomedicine in particular, annotation is a core activity, and there has been work to standardize the annotations before. Uh, so we're happy that um, the annotation standard has recently been uh, accepted by the W3C, the standards body for the web, and is now um, can be built upon and generally used. 
uh, if one uses standardized annotations, ideally you'd be able to use any client that can make an annotation, but you'd be able to share these and, and ingest them and use them so that we can take advantage of a shared annotation layer instead of having everything uh, siloed in proprietary and locked into individual tools. So as I mentioned, and I'll show annotations and annotated documents can be shared. Currently, Hypothesis works primarily with text, although you can uh, use tables and numbers, but it does work on a variety of formats, so you can annotate on HTML, uh, PDFs, and also uh, EPUB format that was just released. And as I'll show you later, um, Hypothesis can actually sync across uh, different versions of the same article. So that means if you're reading these articles in different places, you technically will be able to share annotations across the different ways that the article is represented. Um, you can annotate in public. So Hypothesis was originally conceived as sort of a public discussion forum, uh, but there's also the ability to annotate for your own private use or in private groups. And I will say that since private groups has been introduced, that has been the most popular form of annotation. So that means that you can share annotations amongst uh, a group of colleagues whom you specifically invite to join the group, but they are not visible for the public. Public groups is something that will be coming in the future so that you can join a public discussion group, but that is not enabled right now. Groups can annotate collaboratively and asynchronously. So you can both be annotating the same document and your annotations will sync across that. Um, uh, like most web tools, we have some notifications. So if somebody replies to your annotation, uh, you can be notified. Uh, Hypothesis currently doesn't notify you if anybody annotates to your document uh, as part of the public package, but there are things that can be done to allow that to happen. So um, what I like to say is uh, with groups, and you see this a lot in biomedicine that generally have some technical capacity, uh, there's a lot you can do with the Hypothesis system. Uh, they can be collectively searched, and I think that that's one of its most powerful features in that no matter what I'm annotating, I will be able to see all of these annotations in one place that's under my profile. And that means I can search across all the documents that I have annotated and my annotations specifically and not just uh, be able to see them if I remember the document that I've annotated. So um, as a researcher, I have found that this capacity is so powerful that I have replaced downloading papers or um, printing papers, <laughs> scribbling in the margins, with reading online specifically so that I can take advantage of the power that I see with hypothesis and being able to organize my research and notes. You own your annotations, and I think that this is a very important thing. So any public annotation for Hypothesis is covered under an open license, CC0. That means anybody is free to re reuse it. The private annotations are yours. They may be stored on the Hypothesis server, but you can export them and use them yourself. So we do not, um, we do not uh, exert any rights over the content. And as I mentioned, um, one of the new features of Hypothesis is that it now syncs across different versions. There are some caveats to that, and I will show those in just a bit. So what have been some of the current uses in bioscience? Um, mentioned a few of them. Take notes on the web. Uh, we're also working with journals to natively embed Hypothesis into their platforms. So right now, Hypothesis works as a web extension, but if you have a platform, a web platform, and would like to embed it, uh, it's very easy to just embed the client so that it opens up automatically and people don't need to worry about embedding extensions. Um, so a lot of journals are taking this up and are going to make this available. We're going to be trying to use this during the peer review process um, for papers so that instead of writing those terrible reviews where you say on page six, uh, line four, can you change this? You can engage in an interactive, interactive session with a, a reviewer. Um, obviously, post-publication discussion and peer review is an important um, use of this. Journal clubs, a lot of uptake for students in the classroom, so I always put a plug in there. Um, and then the final one really is curation, fact-checking, and feedback. So um, there's a lot of groups who are using Hypothesis for the, these type of activities. Biomedicine is distinguished by the uh, structured nature of their annotations, but there are a lot of groups who are using um, web-based annotation as a way of gathering notes and presenting those and linking back and forth between 
um, assertions in one document to the next, and uh, hopefully I'll be able to show you some examples of that. So here's just a few examples of how hypothesis uh, looks. This is the New England Journal of Medicine article, so I thought I would pop just to the live one to just give you some basic overviews, and I'll show you how to get started in just a moment. So I'm using Chrome, and the Chrome extension is the best tool that we have. It does work with other browsers, and you can actually do a um, extension independent or a plugin independent installation, which I'll show you in a bit, or, or, or trick. But notice that there are no annotations here. However, since I have the Hypothesis uh, client installed up here, there's a little grayed out box that has 15. This is telling me that uh, this document has been annotated with Hypothesis and that there are approximately 15 annotations. And if I activate my plugin, I get to turn on the layer. So this is interactive, uh, so it, you, it, it respects something called the clean page. That means if you wish to turn off the entire annotation client, you may, and also people reading need not see it. But this does tell you that this document has been annotated. So if I activate this, you can see that the highlights have turned on, and also the hypothesis sidebar, which basically can be toggled on and off, so you can uh, remove it uh, and put it off to the side, or you can activate it so that you can see the annotations. Even here, you can use it to turn off the highlights if you find that distracting. So Hypothesis was carefully designed to make sure that the reading experience was as pleasant as possible. Um, this is an annotation that's in the public channel, so you can see public up here. And that means that anybody who uh, has a link to this document in its annotated form or has Hypothesis installed would be able to see these annotations and also participate in a discussion. So here you see that there have been several people who have annotated this over the course of the last year. You will also notice that there are replies. So uh, again, you know, Hypothesis is a web tool, so just like Google Comments and others, you can uh, reply to it and then Alistair Dunning would receive a notification that somebody had replied to his annotation. So that's the way it works. If you click on it, it sinks to the side, and if you select an annotation, it will tell you where that annotation is. So that's basically what Hypothesis um, looks like, the Hypothesis client. And so now I thought we would go through a little bit about how it actually works and also how you can get started yourself. So. I think I have to get back into, I think there we go. Um, this is also just another example of how students are using it in the classroom to do a lot of annotation. And I thought there might be some educators around who might be interested in this. Okay, so here's a, a demonstration now of Hypothesis in Action. I'll be going through a couple of the features. And again, this will be a live demo. I've um, told Jennifer I'm happy to share the slides with everybody afterwards. And that has a lot of links to these so that you can do them yourself if you have difficulty uh, following along or if I'm going too fast. So um, let's get started. All right, so the basic functions of Hypothesis, I've mentioned several of them. It's a web annotation tool. So I've indicated um, generally as an individual, unless the platform that you're using installs Hypothesis, and by that I mean you do not, again, have to put in any specialized plugin. It comes with uh, your tool. Um, you will see the uh, annotation sidebar and you will see the little uh, notifications. But generally, uh, most people work through the client themselves or through one of the plugins. So if you go to the Hypothesis homepage, it's very easy to get started. There's a little link down here that says get started. And essentially, it does require that you have an account because obviously you want to be able to organize your annotations and manage uh, permissions. So you need to sign up for an account. There is an activation email that gets sent, so you have to make sure that you uh, activate your account. Then you can install Hypothesis to your browser. As we indicated, Chrome works the best, but there is support for other browsers. And it's very simple to follow the instructions. Basically, you just drag these things into your browser and they work as bookmarklets. So the installation is really very, very simple. Once you have it installed, 
you have this little uh, bookmarklet up here or this little indicator that I mentioned that you can turn on and off and use as is necessary. Now I will show you later on that you can actually annotate without any of these things installed using a hypothesis, hypothesis uh, proxy server um, called VIA. And that also makes it possible for you to share annotated documents with somebody who does not have Hypothesis installed or may not even know what Hypothesis is. Um, we don't recommend that for regular use, but it is good if you need to sort of expand beyond your group or you want to get another opinion on it, there is a way forward of not actually having to have the client installed. The Hypothesis homepage also has links to help. And, um, this has recently been updated, and you can see that there are tutorials and how-tos, there are facts, and also some common troubleshooting. I will say that because Hypothesis works on the web and we have no control about what goes on in the web, oftentimes one runs into little troubles. Sometimes that's Hypothesis, sometimes it's just the nature of web pages. Um, but this is actually a very good guide to go through it. Also, uh, Hypothesis maintains, uh, you know, full bug reporting and um, the team itself is very responsive if you run into trouble. So, sign up for an account, uh, help. A notice here that I have new and that is that you can actually associate your ORCID, the researcher ID and author ID with your profile so that uh, eventually we want to make it that you can get credit for your annotations, but at the very least, this provides a way for people in, a, for example, a public channel to be able to see your profile if it's a public profile and understand a little bit about who is uh, annotating. It will also in the future allow us to identify, for example, that the annotations come from the author of an article. So just a little, little aside there. So now let's get started with annotating with Hypothesis. We'll show how this actually works in a uh, live situation. And um, let's see which one I have here. I wanted to have a test article open here. So here's an article that's in PLOS uh, called Bibliometrics for Social Validation. Uh, I have my Hypothesis client installed up here. I have it activated. Remember, if I turn that off, it disappears. If I turn it on, it will appear. This one tells me that I have annotations on this page, which I do. The number does not always completely accurate, but the fact that there is an annotation there is generally accurate. So how would I get started um, annotating? Basically, I would activate my uh, extension and then select some text, just like you would with any annotation tool. And a little uh, button shows up, a little window, which asks if you want to annotate or highlight. So a highlight is just what it suggests. It highlights it in yellow, but it doesn't um, offer you the opportunity to add any type of annotation. But for example, if you're annotating for your private use and just like to underline, uh, you can do that using Hypothesis. But mostly for our purposes here, we're going, to function, we're going to focus on the annotate window. So here you see that it is highlighted, the text. It gives you a little snippet up here, which is what is being uh, annotated to. And then it opens up a little uh, editing window where you can compose your annotation. So this paper uh, is an interesting way to measure tool uptake in a community, you can go ahead and type your annotation. <laughs> it has spell checking there, you see. Um, up here, it gives you basic editing functions, so you can make things bold or uh, italicize or add quotes. You can also insert links to other documents. If you click on this, it just asks you what link you'd like to insert. It will also allow you to um, insert images or videos into your annotation. So if you want to make an annotation that's a, 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 an image, you can in fact insert that. It's got basic math markup and other types of um, formatting functions. You can also see that any annotation can be tagged, obviously a very important thing. The most common tag, of course, is text. <laughs> and I'm going to put that there so I can find it later and delete it since this is not a real annotation but I can go ahead and tag my annotation. Um, once I post, 
you'll notice here that it says post to public. This means that this would be in the public channel. I also know that it's in the public channel because up here it says public. I'll go over how you set up a private group in just a moment. But even when I'm just logged in as myself, I always have the option of making an annotation private only to me or to put it in the public channel. So I have the option of doing both. Um, if you create a group, it will ask you, do you want to make it public to the entire group or do you want it only for yourself? So you always have that option of going back and forth. If I Mary, post, I, yes? Can I just ask a really quick question? This is Jonathan Berg at UNC Chapel Hill Hi, John. on this issue of public versus private. Mm -hmm. um, is it possible to have a group established, like a particular group is curating a set of genes, but yes. for them, for their posts to always be made public? So, so that it's identified as coming from a group but is yes. publicly available. That's a common feature. Right now there is a workaround to do that but it's not something you can do through the client, but that feature should be available shortly because it is a common, it's a, okay. it's a common request. But um, I asked John Udell to join us from Hypothesis, who's our technical guru. Is, is he on? I'm here, is my audio working? Yes, there it is. <laughs> okay, so, great. The reason why I wanted John on is because uh, he really has been, he's like, he deals with integrations with groups has ways of groups being able to do the things that they want to do even though they're not yet available through the public service. So, uh, John, you should also stop me if I say anything that is untrue. <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay. Um, so, essentially, now you see this annotation is here. Um, over here in the sidebar, it tells me that there's two annotations and this little counter tells me approximately where these annotations are. Um, up here, it gives us a count of all the annotations that are on the page, so it, it does let you filter and search and sort annotations. You will also notice at this top menu that there are two different types of annotations. One of them is called annotation, which basically is what I've just gone through. That is something that is anchored to a specific place in the text. But there are also something called page notes, and page notes basically are uh, just notes that are attached to the entire document and aren't anchored to a specific place. So that's a very good place, for example, to share notes on this is an important article or whatever it is that you want to say about this article without needing to anchor it to something specific. So, so there are these two different types. This little icon here uh, activates the page note. So if I click on that and I do this, this is a page note and I post it to public, it's not, it is not anchored to any place specifically in the text. It's just anchored to the entire document. Okay. Um, so let me just go back and make sure I'm on. Yes, so public and private annotations we went through and, oops, sorry, uh, syncing of annotations and then also sharing annotations and working. I think groups is in the next step, but I, I think I'll go over groups now. So as we mentioned, you have the option of annotating either in the public channel or private to you. Over here is your personal uh, profile. But there's also a group function. So essentially, uh, Hypothesis lets you create a private annotation group. I have a lot of groups, so you have to scroll all the way down to the bottom. But it basically is very simple. You give it a, a group name and um, go ahead and uh, it, give it a description. When you, okay, group name. When you create a new group, uh, it's going to ask you if you want to invite new members. That's very simple to do. Basically, all you do is share the link with them and they can join this group. So right now, it's basic levels of privacy. It's kind of like Google Docs that anybody who has the link is allowed to, uh, is allowed to see it. Uh, so it's sort of basic level privacy. Additional levels of privacy uh, will be added. Um, but it's a very easy way. It's very easy to add people uh, to the group. And as I'll show you uh, a bit later when we go through the profile page, you can see that you can see all the, the documents that have been annotated. You can um, go ahead and, um, you know, uh, uh, see who members are and filter your annotations according to who's in the group. 
So annotating in the group channel is just very simple. If you want to annotate in the group channel, you basically select your group. If I then add uh, an annotation, test annotation, you'll notice again that it asks, do you want it to go only to yourself? So even when you're annotating in a group, you can make it private, or do you want to make it public to the group? So if I select Cybot Curation, it's going to go out to the uh, entire group. So that's basically how you do group management. Uh, here we're going to go back into the public channel. Let me just cancel this and get rid of it. So I did mention that this right had social features. It's very easy to edit an annotation. You can delete an annotation. Here's how you do a reply. Basically, uh, click the reply button. You can go ahead and compose it. And then, as I said, a notification gets sent. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, sharing annotated documents with um, different groups and sharing annotations. So Hypothesis, uh, as I mentioned before, does actually let you share an annotated document with somebody, even somebody who does not have um, the Hypothesis client installed. And that's this link up here that's called uh, Share This Page. This uses the service that I mentioned called VIA. To share this with somebody, all you do is click on mail. Oops, that's right, I closed my mail client, so it might take a while to come up. And it composes an email with that link in it. So this allows you to share an annotated document with uh, your colleagues. They will be able to see the annotations. They will not be able to make any annotations unless they have the Hypothesis client installed and an account, or not the client installed, but as long as they have an account, but they um, will be able to see and uh, the document plus the annotation. A question that I had from Jennifer is about paywalled content and whether people are allowed to uh, see content that is behind a paywall. Um, I am not a lawyer, but this view of these little tiny snippets generally seems to be fair use. We're allowed to share uh, small snippets of text. But if an article is behind a paywall and the person who is seeing it does not have rights to that, they will be able to see the annotations. They will not be able to see the underlying document. So this, this uh, does not, hypothesis does not manage your rights to see the article itself that is handled through your institution and your agreements with um, publishers. Okay. Um, so I also wanted to show that Hypothesis basically tags and ties its annotations to specific URLs. But we know that in the scientific literature, there may be multiple copies of the same article in different places. So there may be a PDF version. There may be an HTML version. There may be a version over in PubMed and PubMed Central. And recently, Hypothesis, uh, Hypothesis records the DOI, the digital object identifier, of these, um, of these documents. So it technically knows that the same document has been annotated. But recently, it's added the capacity to actually be able to sync across these different versions. So for example, uh, with this particular article, I got a lot of windows open. This is bibliometrics for social validation. This is the PLOS One article. It's got uh, all of these annotations on it. Let me go ahead and close that. This is, uh, I think, oops, I gotta get rid of that one. I have different versions of this article open in different places. This is the PDF version of that article. And you'll notice that when I open it up, there's a little red button up here. This says that there's been additional annotations that have been added since the last time I looked at it. And if I click those, it actually downloads the page notes that I've added and the annotations that I've added. So um, oops. now what's interesting here is that it did give me an orphan in this case. And that's because that sometimes the PDFs and the EPUBs and the HTML version handle certain things differently. If Hypothesis is unable to figure out where something is uh, anchored, it will list it as an orphan. So in this case, it seemed to be unable to figure out that um, this 
this particular annotation was anchored here at the beginning of a PDF. Um, sometimes this happens because the way PDFs are done. But um, in general, you don't lose annotations. Hypothesis tries to anchor it across the different versions. And at the very least, you're notified that this annotation was here. Over here is the same article again at PubMed Central Europe. And I'll tell you why we're in PubMed Central Europe in just a moment. But if I again hit this download button, it says, here's an annotation that has been made. Here's a, the page note that I added uh, over on the HTML version. And it also has an orphan annotation. In this case, I made an annotation to a figure legend. And the way that European PubMed Central handles figures, they don't embed them into the actual article. They open them up in a new window. So Hypothesis was unable to sync. So syncing across the different versions is not perfect, but at least it gives you a basic functionality to know that if a uh, document has been annotated in one or more of the different forms that the, the annotations will be able to sync. And I think this capacity will only get better. There are some places, however, where this fails. And as I mentioned in the beginning, Hypothesis is built on the web. And so we are at the mercy of how people actually create their pages. So while you'll notice that this syncing works in PubMed Central Europe, it does not actually work in PubMed Central in the United States. So here you can see that it says that there are no annotations. And that's because PubMed Central Europe exposes the DOI in a way that Hypothesis can read it, whereas PubMed Central in the United States doesn't. So if Hypothesis is able to sync the annotations, it will, but it's not always going to be able to do that. Hopefully, we're working with uh, PubMed and other places to get them to uh, kind of think in a more web-enabled world. That's also true, I would say, of syncing across the PDF and the HTML version. So generally, you can annotate the PDF version or the HTML version. And with few glitches, they sync pretty well across each other. But if the publisher does not put a link to the HTML version in the header of their PDF, then Hypothesis is not able to do this. So sometimes, as I mentioned, it fails. And it doesn't fail because of Hypothesis per se. It fails because, again, when publishers and others were creating these things, they were not really thinking of this in terms of the web. But I think that that is changing. The capacity to be able to think across documents, I should also say, uh, carries to being able to annotate offline. So if you are annotating a PDF offline, uh, and then you later go online, there is a way of actually syncing the annotations from the uh, annotated version that you've done offline with the online version. I should also say there, though, as a caveat, that's only if you're using your browser to annotate. You can use your browser in offline mode. It doesn't work if you're using like a, an Adobe product, because that's a proprietary product. But essentially, again, Hypothesis is a very powerful way of being able to work asynchronously in different geographical locations and time zones on the same document. So I hope that that was just a basic overview of how Hypothesis works um, and how you create an annotation and how you share annotations. I know I'm going through a lot of material. So as I said, I'm, I'm more than happy to share the slides. And I hope some of you even have the client installed and are basically following along. Um, I've put a link here to federating annotations using DOIs. This is a blog that John has written that kind of gives you uh, the details. So now I wanted to talk about uh, some more specific features. In particular, again, one of the most powerful features of Hypothesis is that unlike most annotations, even in Google Docs or in Adobe products where you can't search the contents of the annotation. Here you are allowed to search the contents of your annotation. Hypothesis has recently redone um, the profile page. So if I click on this, it will open up my particular profile page. This will tell me all how many uh, annotations I have made, how much annotation I've done in the last seven days. You actually can search across the public channel. Um, so basically, anything from the public channel is open for search. But if you use the user tag, and we give you a set of uh, structured searches here, you can go ahead and um, just narrow your search and filter your search. 
So this is my group activity. This tells me how many annotations are on each page. It gives me my top tags. It's very easy to um, essentially uh, filter according to a tag. So if I pick on a tag here, it will give me all of the documents that have been annotated using that particular tag. Uh, what's interesting too is you can also uh, use that function from the documents themselves. So if I go to a tag, I thought I had created one as a test, but I don't see it. Um, if I go here for a tag and I click, for example, test, it will go to the hypothesis stream and give me all the annotations that have been tagged for test. So you can go back and forth between the annotations in situ and also your profile page. Okay, that's the group page. Um, it also, whoops, here it is. So it also tells you what groups you're members of. You can search for group names. That's a very easy way of keeping track of all of this. Um, but I wanted to use this function also to show you some of the more powerful linking functions that Hypothesis has. And that is something that um, I think is really interesting. So if I open up any different document, it will give me a summary of all the annotations that I have. It will give me the URL so that I can go directly to the URL. It will give me a list of annotators for that page, a list of tags that were used on that page, and it will also allow me to view annotations in context. So if I click on this, Essentially, it will take me to that page and it will open it up and it will then show me that particular annotation in context. So you'll notice here that I'm able to go to exactly the place in that document and it then shows me that annotation. If I want to see the rest of the annotations, I can open them up or I can just stay with that particular one. But we also allow people to share what we call these direct links to annotations. So if I use this button over here called share, it opens up a little window for me. I can share it via social media. I can send an email. I can do it however I want. But what that does is provide a direct link to that annotation that I can share with somebody. And this works exactly like the via service in the sense that the person I am sharing it with does not have to have the hypothesis client installed Rather, they will be able to open it up and see that annotation in situ. They need an account if they want to reply um, but in, or to annotate further, but just to view it, they're able to share it. So this is a very powerful capability if you think about it. And I myself have taken advantage of it in my research now because what that allows me to do is to attach very detailed notes to anything that I'm writing in a paper. If I've quoted a statistic, I can link directly to that statistic if I want to fact check. And John has really, uh, John Udell, who's on here from Hypothesis, has created some wonderful demonstrations of how this capacity can essentially be used to link across fragments in different papers, but also to be able to gather all of the evidence for a particular statement in one particular place that might be used to support uh, an assertion. So we know that this is very important in, in the context of curation. The evidence for how uh, somebody curates something may in fact be an amalgamum of annotations that are made across multiple documents. And this becomes a very, very powerful way for you to assemble that evidence together in one place. So I think that direct links are in fact one of the coolest things that we actually have. Uh, in hypothesis, and I think something that might be of uh, real value to a group that's distributed that's trying to share uh, annotations, get different opinions, and again, come to consensus about, for example, how one annotates. So, for example, you might be able to write a wiki page that has a discussion of how one is going to annotate, and then all of the specific examples can be gathered underneath in a very easy way. So those are the basic functions right now of Hypothesis. As I mentioned, these are all the ones that are exposed through the public client. We have basic levels of tagging, uh, replying, direct links, 
public-private groups. I wanted to show a few examples of how um, hypothesis uh, is being used in a couple of different curation scenarios. But I also wanted to point to something which I've alluded to already called what we call hypothesis labs. And that is as an open source software project, we have a lot of people who are creating customized extensions. John himself has done some wonderful work showing how using just basic hypothesis functionality you can create a powerful tool suite that does the more um, kind of structured and what I call a deep annotation or heavy duty annotation that often characterizes uh, biomedicine. So even though the main hypothesis client may not do something, I encourage you to contact John or also go to our tools and plugins page because there you can do things that aren't yet available in the public client but we're more than happy to have groups try this out, give us feedback, and, and implement uh, this capacity for whatever their particular project is. So some of the things that um, you can get through these customized uh, workarounds are the ability to export your annotations into databases, tagging with a controlled vocabulary. We don't do full-on ontological tagging, but there are workarounds to be able to at least uh, give everybody the same list in a controlled tagging. We do some syncing with reference managers, being able to gather footnotes and those type of things. And we've even had groups, uh, one in particular is Science in the Classroom from the American Association of the Advancement of Science, which is using the Hypothesis backend to do all of its annotations, but they created a customized front end uh, to be able to actually look at those annotations. And actually, I don't think this is that's the uh, Hypothesis client. Um, but this is an example of something called Science in the Classroom, where they've color-coded all their annotations. And these were all done using uh, Hypothesis, but um, the Hypothesis backend, but they built a customized front end to display these in the way that they wanted to display them. So it's a very powerful and flexible um, platform, is basically what, <laughs> what the point is. Um, so just a quick few things of how uh, this is being used for more structured annotations, if that's what you're interested in. Um, this is my uh, colleague, David Kennedy, at the University of Massachusetts. He's a neuroimager. And he's been basically using Hypothesis as a very quick and lightweight curation tool to curate the neuroimaging uh, literature. And with his programmer and John, they've been able to export these structured annotations into tables, essentially implement a little uh, simple data model towards which they can annotate. Um, and again, using control tags and other things, essentially be able to extract structured information from the literature without a whole lot of programming. Uh, this is a project that I am in particularly enamored of, which is called Cybot. This is work that's going on with uh, some of my colleagues at UCSD where they're using hypothesis to uh, curate uh, these special identifiers, research resource identifiers that are being now uh, required by journals to identify uh, organisms, um, antibodies, and certain types of reagents inside the materials and methods. This was introduced because I'm sure, as you as curators know, authors don't often supply enough identifying information uh, to be able to tell what it exactly they used inside of their papers. So there are about uh, 250 journals that are participating in these research resource identifiers. Those of you with good eyes can see there's something here called an RRID, which is a namespace that then is followed by an accession number that comes from a database. So we have about 2,000 papers or close to 3,000 papers that have appeared with these RRIDs. And our colleagues wanted to know how accurate are the authors being? Uh, are these valid IDs? Basically, they wanted to curate this data set. Obviously, trying to go through manually and look at each one of these and then go to a database to resolve them was very, very difficult. But using a specialized hypothesis client, we were able to identify a curatorial workflow that used both automated and human curation. So essentially, uh, the way that the workflow works is that there's a little specialized script that John and a graduate student worked on that recognizes RRIDs inside of papers. It's not a hard task because they're just regular expression. Goes ahead and highlights the RRIDs. It sends a call to a database that aggregates the information from the source databases for these RRIDs, and then it pipes them 
into the client. So here you can see a paper from eLife that has been annotated by the Cybot Curation Group. And this is the annotation here. It's an antibody. This annotation was generated by a call to a resolving service which took the information from the database and ported it into the hypothesis client. But now the, the a group was able to use the reply functions to help tag it, to enter into discussions, basically to uh, provide the curation. So here you can see that uh, they have a curatorial tag called validated, which meant that this was a correct ID and it was able to actually extract information uh, accurately from the resolving service. So they've done about uh, over uh, 1,800 papers, about 30,000 annotations with a relatively small team by essentially con combining semi-automated and human curation together. And then all of this information is then in uh, exported into a database. So that's just some of the things that you can do. Um, if you have time, I want to make sure I leave time for questions, but there's a little YouTube video that shows how it works in real time. Um, I think I'll skip that right now just to get to the end because I see we're coming to the end of the time. Uh, I kind of already went through a few of these, but I thought that these were probably salient points, so I wanted to put them out here. This hypothesis work offline. Yes, you can annotate a PDF offline and then sync with the online version, although you have to be annotating in your browser. Um, what about sharing annotations on copyrighted material? I already sort of talked about that. And can I export my annotations? And, and again, we don't own uh, your annotations. They may be exported and reused. Public annotations are covered by a CC0 license. Private annotations are your annotations, and so it's really up to you. And public group annotations, I think, would be the same thing. So my goal in biomedicine, obviously, has been to try to both show that this is a very, very powerful platform that you can use, that is free to use, but also knowing that the same papers are annotated over and over and over again, I thought it would be a really wonderful thing for us to easily be able to share those annotations. I know NCBI has taken some steps in that towards that, but I think this is a much lighter weight solution so that we would actually be able to learn from or reuse other people's curatorial efforts. So I'm going to open this up now for questions. We have both John and myself here, uh, and I'm willing to show anything that's unclear or take questions. Mary Ann, this is Anna Morales. Great presentation. I'm really excited about this tool. I mm -hmm. have a couple of questions. I um, wanted to clarify if the ability to annotate is restricted to published uh, literature versus other forms of HTML documents, for example, ClinVar, to name something off the top. No. If you have a web page, it's basically to web pages. And if those web pages are private to you, you can still annotate them. Um, so it's not published articles. It's, okay. It's web content. Web content. And yes. the other question I had is in terms of privacy, are the annotations available to the hypothesis staff or others as they are um, no. put into no. the plugin? If they are public, they everyone can see them. If they are private, Hypothesis does not see them. Um, John can chime in here because I imagine it would technically be possible, but it is not something. So I think if the, if the question is, do, yeah. does, do, does the operational staff have access yes. to the database, mm -hmm. then the answer is yes. And if the follow-on question is, how do we prevent that, then the follow-on answer is, it's an open source product and you could stand up your own instance of the service and control it yourself. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mary Ann, it's Jonathan Burke from UNC again. That was really terrific and I'm also very excited about it. It looks like a really mm -hmm. neat um, tool. Um, one thing, and you may have already said this and maybe it deals with mm -hmm. what we were talking about with the copyrighted materials, but so, you know, there's a lot of things that are available uh, only if you have a sort of library subscription or, or yes. so forth, so things that are behind a paywall. Mm -hmm. um, does, I mean, presumably you're allowed to annotate it if you have access to it, but other people may not be able to see it if they don't. Is that how it works? Right. So the way it works is um, 
you can share the annotations themselves with anybody. And our reading of fair use, and there's a lot of stuff on the web, although I am not a lawyer, is that just sharing those small snippets of annotated text, because Hypothesis will display the, annota uh -huh. you know, the annotated snippet, that that is legal to do. So you can share those freely with colleagues. They will not be able to see the entire article unless they have the rights to see it. Okay, so for example, like yeah. one use case might be that um, ClinGen might want to annotate all of the genetic variants that are listed within a given paper mm -hmm. and make those annotations publicly available. And that would be yeah. one way to basically allow people to find those variants yeah. in a paper and then they could decide for themselves <laughs> if they needed to pay for the article to get access to it or not. Yes, exactly. And that's what the RRID people are using too because a lot of times the RRIDs are buried in the paper. Um, and they are considered facts, and it's like nobody nobody owns those. I think that the challenges are, for example, if you were, I think we limit the amount of text you're allowed to select at any given moment, so you couldn't, for example, select an entire article or even right. a gigantic section and then use that as a way of getting around copyright. Right now it's just um, restricted to small snippets. Okay. Yeah. But as I said, we are an overlay. So we do not manage the rights to the underlying content that is entirely up to the provider. And, and, so, and I think that the previous question was about um, mm -hmm. annotating other websites. So how, mm -hmm. how much annotation of other websites would depend on sort of how frequently those websites are being updated? Would your annotations go away if a, if a you know, an outside website Sort of like changed or how would that be maintained and so hypothesis does try as if it hasn't changed too much um, for example the same text can be found but maybe it's moved over it does use fuzzy anchoring and various tricks to try to re-anchor it if it absolutely can't find it however that's what these orphans are for so you would at least have a record that such text existed and hypothesis says we can't figure out where this was but there's also a little widget, I don't know if it's been implemented and John can correct me, where um, we do want to make it so that if you do annotate a page, you can deposit automatically in the Internet Archive so that you would be able to get back to the page that you annotated. I believe that you can do that right now, it's just not the little simple go ahead and, and archive it. But I think that's why the, the orphaned annotations are so important you don't lose the annotations anymore. It used to be, well, we don't know what to do with these, but now it appears in that separate column and says, we had this text at one time, we don't have it anymore, but you have a date and time stamp of when it was there. One example. Yeah, I, I want to just amplify that point a little bit. Sorry, uh, yeah. The Internet Archive or other archive angle is really important here. Mm -hmm. um, we've been working with the folks at the Internet Archive um, initially so the same mechanism that'll, that allows for the mapping of annotations across a family of related documents like the HTML and PDF versions, um, that same kind of mechanism is possible uh, with an archive so that the archive copy can essentially join the equivalence set. Um, and uh, we're, we're trying to work with publishers and archives to establish ground rules so that that will all happen more reliably than it does now. Mm -hmm. uh, you had another so, question, Jonathan? Yeah. I was going to. I was just going to sort of give an example of potentially okay. how a web, a web document would be useful to annotate. And that is the OMIM uh, database. Are you familiar yeah. with that? Yeah. yeah. Have you had any interactions with them about this tool? And we haven't yet. I've just started my foray into like PubMed, and I think OMIM is now kind of. Aren't they being abandoned by PubMed? <laughs> they, I know there was well, something going on that, that they have to do. Um, but I, I haven't reached out to OMIM specifically. Um, I think it would be really cool because so what they do, my understanding is what they do is they, they you know, basically read the, you know, they oh, read yeah. their full text and, and annotate them. They mark them up somehow um, mm -hmm. in order to write their, um, their summaries. Um, but if they could be using a system that could make those markups publicly available in annotations and tag them so that they yeah. could be found by ClinGen using those terms, it would be fantastic. And we do have a relationship with, I don't know if anybody from, from OMIM is on this call right now, but 
um, you know, we have a relationship with them. And, and oh, I'd love to pursue that. Um, That's and a great and we could curate the OMIM web site pages with this tool as a way yeah. to communicate back and forth. So I think it, it really would be fantastic to yeah. be able to do that. That actually would be a, a fantastic use case. And so if we could have a follow-up, or I would be happy to follow up with you, I would love to pursue that. Because I could see, you, you know, you may be basically be able to track back almost every statement, gather all the notes together about this in their summary. And then you'd be able to link directly to the snippets of evidence and just be able to see them, right? Here's all the snippets that support this. That would be tremendous, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. We do have one database in the social sciences, which is uh, pursuing something similar. So I think that, you know, as just as a general use case, it would be fantastic. Hey, Marianne, I just want to mention that I have a 10 o'clock, so if there's another question for me, ask now. <laughs> I think technically I do, too. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> um, that one I can be late, too. Um, other questions, comments? Okay. Uh, I do want to say that if you want to get a group together to kind of work, I'm more than happy to do kind of an online live um, working session. Uh, I know John, would he loves those too because he loves to watch the way people interact with it. So if you do think this is something that you're interested in, don't hesitate to contact, us, to contact me or John, and we'd be happy to walk people through actually annotating some 